All right, this is Mr. Block, and I'm gone today, obviously. So we're, we're still going to start on the next section uh, of our chapter, which is on meiosis. Meiosis is similar but different to mitosis that we learned earlier. Uh, mitosis is how we make somatic cells of the body, so the, your body cells, the trillion cells that make up you. All right, these cells are 2N, or diploid, which means they have two copies of each chromosome, okay? In meiosis, we're going to make sex cells, or what we call gametes. These cells are haploid, so they only have half of the genetic material, okay? So why is that important? Well, because when we are making gametes, we want to have half the cell, half of the chromosomes, so that when we bring sperm and egg together and firm, make that first zygote, it will then have 46 chromosomes. So each one has 23, one copy of each, sperm and egg come together, and then we make a zygote that has 46. Okay, so hopefully most of you already know that we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, all right, we, or a total of 46 chromosomes. Okay, these chromosomes, we call them homologous, okay, so, in other words, you get one from your mother and one from your father, and they're homologous in the fact that they're not identical, but they code for the same material, okay? Now, when we do meiosis, we'll actually have two pairs of homologous chromosomes, and that they'll make something called a tetrad, all right? Some other uh, uh, terminology we need to know is something called the locus or loci. And this is one specific point on the chromosome. All right. So 22 of our chromosomes we call autosome. So they're just make body cells. And then we have the 23rd chromosome, which is our sex chromosome. All right. So here's that tetrad that I was going to, I talked about that we will see in meiosis. Okay. So these are, you can see the Locus, locus for eye color. They're not care. They're coding for the same thing, but they're not identical. Okay, this is something called a karyotype. We can take a picture of your chromosomes, line them up like this, and so you can see we how we have 22 autosomal, and then the 23rd tells us whether we have a male or female. So in this case, we would have a a male. Okay. Okay. So on the 23rd chromosome, in males, we have an X and a Y, and in females, we have two X's or uh, two cr two copies of the X chromosome. So we did the Punit square uh, a couple days ago and showed how you know there's a 50% chance of getting a male or female because you have a 50% chance of getting the X chromosome or the Y chromosome from your father. Okay, so meiosis. Like I said, meiosis is similar to mitosis um, except for the fact that we are going to have two different divisions. So we'll have a meiosis one and a meiosis two. And a lot of the steps that we see will be very similar to what we saw in mitosis. We'll have <coughs> prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. We even have an interphase. Okay, so we are going to take a diploid cell, a 2N cell, and then we are going to make a haploid. Okay, and the, like it says here, the importance of this is to make sure we are giving the next generation the right number of chromosomes. All right, now just like in mitosis, meiosis has an interphase as well. And it has that S phase, which stands for synthesis. So we are going to duplicate the chromosomes. All right, now in mitosis, we only had a haploid cell and we duplicate it. Here we're starting with a diploid cell, so we're going to end up with four homologous chromosomes. All right, just some other terminology to remember. Uh, in the middle of the chromosomes are the two sisters. They are attached together by the 
centromere, and then we have the centrioles that have the spindle fibers that will control the meiosis, okay? And we call the genetic material, if it's not wound up into chromosomes, we call it chromatid. Okay, so during interphase one, we can see the nucleus and we can see the nucleolus. So we know, like in mitosis, that the first step of prophase was when the nuclear envelope broke down. All right, so okay, so meiosis one, we have four phases just like we did in mitosis. You have a prophase one, metaphase one, an anaphase one, and a telophase one. So now it's going to look a little bit different, and there's going to be some different things that are going to happen in prophase one that doesn't happen in mitosis. Um, and this is the longest and most complex phase because there's some different things going on here. All right, remember that our chromosomes are going to condense before this process. So they're going to go from chromatid, which is, which is like string, into chromosomes. Okay, and they're going to form tetrads, two chromosomes, two sister chromatids that are going to be right next to each other. Okay. Okay, two sisters, two sets of sisters joined together, forming a tetrad. Okay, now, during prophase one, an interesting thing happens called crossing over, okay? And this is when the two sister chromatids are going to get really, really close to each other, and they're going to, their legs are basically going to cross over. And we call that spot where the two cross over, we call that the chiasmata, all right? And what this is going to do for us is it's going to give us genetic diversity, okay? In other words, those two chromosomes... You know, when you're making body cells, somatic cells, you want everything identical. Well, when we're, the purpose of sex is to make variation and to have, we don't want you exactly like your mom and we don't want you exactly like your dad. So when we, we do crossing over so that these, a little bit of one chromosome ends up on the other chromosome. And so they're not exact copies of one another, giving us variation. All right. So after crossing over occurs, just like before, we get spindle fiber formation from the centrioles to the centromeres. Before, though, you know, in mitosis, we would have only had one X in the middle of it instead of two Xs. Then we start metaphase one. And if you remember before, the M in metaphase stands for the middle. Okay, so the tetrads are going to align in the middle. All right, now, something else occurs in metaphase that gives us a lot of variation as well, and that's independent assortment. So if you remember when we did our punit squares, we talked about the fact that uh, genes or loci, loci on different chromosomes aren't attached to one another. So the chromosome in pea plants for... Uh, height was not attached to the one for uh, flower color. Okay, it's the same thing here. And basically, what this means is that those X's, when they are pulled apart during metaphase, you don't know which one's going to end up in which cell. Okay, maybe your mother's ends up in the cell that fertilizes the egg, maybe the other one. So you're not going to get 23 from your mom. You're not going to get 23 from your dad. You're going to get a mixture of this, okay, because you don't know how they're going to line up. So that doesn't seem like a big deal until you think about that we have 23 chromosomes, and each one we have the possibility of getting one or the other. Well, 2 to the 23rd, if you do that calculation, is millions of possibilities. Okay, so that gives us lots of genetic variation which means that's why you don't look exactly like your parents. So 
after independent assortment, we meet in the middle. And then we have anaphase 1. And this is where we're going to pull the tetrads apart. Okay, we're not pulling the sister chromatids that are attached together apart, but the two, the tetrad apart. Like this. So now that we have now we have telophase 1 and now we have an X that's going to end up in each of two cells and then we have cytokinesis like we did in mitosis which we're going to cut those cells in two so at the end of meiosis 1 we will have two cells that are haploid okay Okay, right after this, we start meiosis 2. Okay, there's no interphase at all. We go instantly into this next step. All right, we're not going to du duplicate the DNA this time like we had in the interphase before meiosis 1. Okay, so this is going to be exactly like mitosis. Okay, we are going to have prophase. So we're going to attach the spindle fibers again. This is happening in two different cells at the same time now. We're going to have metaphase, where they're going to meet in the middle. We're going to have anaphase, where now we are going to pull the sisters apart at the centromere. All right. So with us, we'd have 23 pairs that we would be 23 chromosomes that we would be pulling apart. Okay, then we have telophase, so we're going to pull them apart, and we're going to reform the nuclei, and then we're going to have cytokinesis that happens after telophase two, and at the end of this, at the end of the day, we end up with four haploid daughter cells. All right, so these will be four sperm, four eggs, that can be fertilized. All right, now, sometimes during this process, uh, some things don't go right, okay? And this is when we get something called a non-disjunction disorder. And this usually happens during uh, the crossing over, when those two chromosomes are squished together really t tight and they're exchanging genetic information. Okay, sometimes when we pull them apart at that point, they don't pull apart right. Okay, in other words, instead of ending up with a chromosome in each one, we end up with three chromosomes in one and one in the other. Okay, so this can cause abnormalities in our zygote, okay, when this occurs. Okay, now, if a cell, one of the gametes that ended up with the one chromosome is fertilized, we can get something called a monosomy. So they have one less chromosome than they are supposed to have. Instead of 46, they have 45. If the one that has the three copies is fertilized, we can get a trisomy, which means we have three copies of a certain chromosome. So there is something called a trisomy 18, or a trisomy 21, or a monosomy 23, okay? Now, we don't normally know these names, but a lot of you know that what Down syndrome is and know some of the genetic defects that occur in Down syndrome. So this is technically a trisomy 21. So they have three copies of the 21st chromosome. Turner syndrome. We have a couple different uh, monosomies and trisomies that occur with the 23rd chromosome. So you can have Turner syndrome, which they only have one X. They're female with one X. Or we have Kleinfelter syndrome, which is a trisomy 23, which they are male because they have the Y, but they have two X's. So usually it's a male, but they're usually a little have some more female characteristics. Uh, then you have Edwards syndrome, which is a trisomy 18. Now, uh, a procedure that can be done 
before um, a child is born is something called amniocentesis. And basically what they can do is they can take some of the amniotic fluid by injecting a needle into uh, the uterus and they can take some of the amniotic fluid and they can do a genetic test for some of these non-disjunction disorders. Okay, now uh, with amniocentesis they can then see whether there's a disorder like this. Okay, now this is where the contra there's controversy with amniocentesis because some people don't want to know, some people would want to know, mm most people, a lot of people, it wouldn't matter whether they did know or they didn't, and you know, uh, they are, uh, you know, trying to get more better testing, better genetic testing for diseases and disorders, and uh, you know, maybe someday we can even uh, have it to where there's not, um, you know, we can stop a trisomy or a non-disjunction disorder from happening in the first place. Now another thing that we can look at and we looked at earlier is something called a karyotype and like I said before um, this gives us a picture of your chromosomes okay and this is where it really is easy to see your uh, non-disjunction disorders. So on this one here we can see that we have this is a male that has three copies of the 21st chromosome. So they would have Down syndrome. 